Hello and welcome to Maximum Lenin, the first talking book about John Lennon. It was written and researched by Alan Clayson, music is by Amanda Thompson and Keith Rodway, and it's read by Robert Rayner. You can check out our full catalogue on our website at www.chromedreams.co.uk where you can also join our Maximum Collectors Club to receive special offers and free CDs. Alternatively, join the Maximum Collectors Club by filling in the registration form attached to the booklet inside this CD and post it back to us. No violence, no starving children, no violent minds, no violent households, no frustration, no fear. Both a figurehead and grey eminence of pop, John Lennon's influence as a vocalist and composer has been acknowledged by every such artist that has mattered and his lyrics quoted like proverbs. During the four-year sabbatical before the brief re-emergence that climaxed in his sudden death in 1980, he became as unreachable an object of myth as Elvis Presley. Though incommunicado when resident in New York's smart Dakota building, there wasn't a newspaper editor in the world who wouldn't promise a fortune for a Lenin exclusive or an up-to-the-minute photo. Rock stars passing through the Big Apple made at least token efforts to gain an audience with the grand old man, despite his many dubious public antics in the past and hearsay about strange goings-on in the Dakota. Having gouged so deep a wound in pop, the repercussions of the Beatles resounded still as their founder member continued an albeit sporadic recording career, yet undoubtedly one containing odd sparks of the old fire that used to power him when the Beatles were stuck on the Liverpool Hamburg treadmill. Then there'd been so many ideas, and not only musical ones, chasing through his mind that it was all he could do to note them down. Flames of inspiration would kindle during a 20-minute stroll to Hamburg's main railway station to buy yesterday's Daily Express. Others jerked him from a velvet blue oblivion back in the dungeons where the Beatles slept during their maiden visit in 1960. Even after the group made it, tomorrow would seem a year away, as together with Paul McCartney, John would figure out a chord sequence to fragments of melody or rhymes, forming a couplet. From a mere title, the ghost of a sketchy chorus would smolder into form, followed by a red-eyed objectivity and a private quality control that would engross him and Paul until day became night, with the two surrounded by cigarette butts, smeared coffee cups, and pages full of scribbled verse and notation peculiar to themselves. As he never learned to sight-read or write musical script, John was untroubled by the formal do's and don'ts that traditionally affect creative flow. There were only the stylistic cliches and habits ingrained since his teenage self had positioned yet uncalloused fingertips on the taut strings of his first guitar. I only learned to play to back myself, he'd say later. When grappling with his muse, he drew from virtually every musical and literary idiom he had ever encountered and realised some extraordinary visions in the process. Yet John Lennon hadn't had all that much going for him when he trod the boards as an amateur with the Quarrymen in 1957. While he could just about find his way around his instrument, he aroused little enthusiasm, either for his singing or his first attempts at songwriting. On the surface, he didn't show brilliance at any one aspect of his craft back then. But within him, as the world was to discover, he had a powerful yet intangible creative thrust. I know I met Paul first, and he sort of joined this sort of group I had, and then, then, then George, you know, gradually changed to the just us three. On the 9th of October 1940, John Winston Lennon was born at Liverpool's Oxford Street Maternity Hospital. The radio weatherman had forecast a dull but mild night, which it was, 
apart from the wailing sirens and flares illuminating the sky as the Luftwaffe dropped ton upon booming ton of death and destruction in and around the slip-slapping wharfs of Dockland where the murky Mersey sweeps into the Irish Sea. The following morning, brick dust crunched beneath the hooves of dray horses dragging coal through mean streets to rusty ships. But Julia Lennon's firstborn was destined for a comfortable middle-class home in Walton, a village-like suburb that aligned itself more with Lancashire than Merseyside. After his father, Freddie, a seaman of Irish extraction, vanished when John was five, domestic complications made it more convenient for the child to grow up in the semi-detached villa of Julia's childless sister, Mary Stanley, who John would always call by his cradle articulation, Mimi. His natural mother, so he was to discover, lived nearby with her second family, and her house would be a bolt hole whenever straight-laced Mimi's parenting methods became oppressive. The innate confusion of who am I to regard as mother affected John's ability to trust adult authority figures whom he mocked and abused as a defense against being rejected by them. Particularly after Julia was killed in 1958 by a car driven by an off-duty policeman. Moreover, Despite the extenuating circumstances, he felt he'd been rejected by his father and cast out by his mother, having had enough experience of her to know what he was missing. Hence the bitterness inherent in outbursts against teachers, particular friends, and even his devoted Aunt Mimi, who usually blamed doubtful company for John's mischief at Dovedale Primary School, where gabardine raincoated and short trousered, he began his formal education in September 1946. Lennon was to go beyond petty shoplifting, stealing fruit from local orchards and similar boyhood larks on gaining a place at Quarry Bank Grammar, nicknamed the Police State, for its draconian affectations and futile rigmarole. Academic streaming was in full force, and so was corporal punishment, administered as often as not with a swish of a bamboo cane on buttocks or outstretched palm. It wasn't long before John was transformed from a capable, if uninvolved, pupil to a sea stream hard case, a known truant, a sharer of smutty stories, and an initiate of a cast who'd graduated from the innocence of tooth rotting bald sweets to the lung corroding evil of cigarettes. Not standing when he could lean, the bad attitude of that Lennon boy was reflected too in extracurricular activities that had little bearing on what was supposed to be his education at Quarry Bank. The most relevant of these teenage diversions was John Lennon's acquisition of an acoustic guitar and subsequent membership of the Quarrymen. His innate bossiness ensured a walkover in the power struggle for leadership of this skiffle group, created in the image of that fronted by Lonnie Donegan, who ruled skiffle during its 1957 prime. Though the style was based on blues, hillbilly and further subdivisions of North American folk music, the less purist quarrymen also embraced rock and roll. And it was this element that impressed a bloke called Paul McCartney when he attended a performance at Walton Summer Fate in 1957. So began one of the most crucial partnerships in pop. And not long after Paul joined the quarrymen, the younger George Harrison succeeded original lead guitarist Eric Griffiths who, like most of the other personnel, regarded Skiffle as a vocational blind alley, a trivial pursuit to be thrust aside on departure to the world of work, marriage or national service. Glasgow with a bad egg. And you know, nobody had sit with him on the train. Among the quarrymen's principal assets were John's gruffly appealing baritone, his instinctive, if indelicate, crowd control, and the vocal interplay between himself and McCartney. The power structure whereby George was to be subordinate to John and Paul for as long as they stayed together was founded on the handshake that had formalized the Lennon McCartney songwriting partnership during John's final year at Quarry Bank. Lennon left school in July 1957 with the reputation of a square peg in a round hole 
and a kinder testimonial than he may have expected. This enabled him to enrol at Liverpool's Regional College of Art, where before the year was out, John, Paul and George, as well as a turnover of other musicians, were being engaged as a recurring support act at student union dances. By then, every other item in their repertoire was a salam to Elvis Presley, Gene Vincent, Jerry Lee Lewis, Chuck Berry, Little Richard, and further behemoths of classic rock. The only concession to a general craze for traditional jazz was Louis Armstrong's When You're Smiling, albeit with John inserting cheeky references to college staff into its lyrics. Though engagements were few and far between, and often undertaken for as little as a round of fizzy drinks, Lennon's preoccupation with the group took its toll on his studies. What did stereoplastic colour, tactile values and vorticisms matter when the group were opening that evening for the Mersey Sippy Jazz Band at Stanley Abattoir Social Club? A lecture-disrupting clown too, Lennon's expulsion seemed inevitable from the start. In preparation for the entrance to class on the very first day, he'd risen early to spend an inordinate amount of time combing his hair into a precarious pompadour, gleaming with brillantine. For quick adjustments, he stuck a comb in the top pocket of his three-quarter length Teddy Boy drape jacket. Then he walked to the bus stop with a somewhat pigeon-toed gait, owing to trousers so tight that it looked as if his legs had been dipped in ink. His feet adorned with blue suede loafers and fluorescent socks, he stood at the college portals and narrowed his short-sighted eyes. He was too vain to be wearing spectacles. The new student's self-image was at odds with the only subject he kept silent about, his privileged upbringing amidst the mock Tudor colonies, golf clubs and boating lakes of Walton. An inverted snob, he'd embraced the machismo values of both Teddy Boys and proletarian Merseyside males and generally came on as the poor honest whacker, a working class hero in fact. By the end of his first term, he was speaking in a raw scouse laced with incessant swearing. Not peculiar to Lennon alone was the notion that northern women were mere adjuncts to their men. John's overwhelmed girlfriend and future wife, Cynthia Powell, seemed to tolerate this role. As one of an entourage united in terrified admiration, she was lost in his shadow as he lunatized round college in the city centre. One remarkable stunt had George and Paul garbed as vicars who, with John as referee, staged a wrestling match in a chain store restaurant until waiters intervened. Few were capable of having a sensible conversation with Lennon. He worked so hard at keeping people amused, he was exhausting, said Rod Murray, a fellow student. One day I saw him running down the street holding a steering wheel. No car, just the wheel. He said he was driving down to town. Back in class, John was impatient of prolonged discussion on art, and it was a veneer of self-confidence rather than any heavily veiled air of learning that swiftly made him a centre of attention. In his defence of Lennon against those at college who wanted him out, course tutor Arthur Ballard insisted that he had some potential aptitude as an illustrator and writer of surreal stories and comic verse. You could see in his work the heritage of Lewis Carroll, reckoned Bill Harry, from the graphics department. He also reminded me of Stanley Unwin, his malapropisms, etc. But there was an Englishness about it when everyone else was copying the Americans. The atmosphere of Bohemian Liverpool was enough like that of New York's vibrant beatnik district, Greenwich Village, to ensure news hounds from the muck-raking Sunday people were sent up north on a crusade to root out what would be headlined the beatnik horror. Lashing those present in Rod Murray's flat with drinks, the journalists assured everyone that the feature was to be about the difficulties of surviving on student grants. This was a cause to which the militant Lennon, along with other hangers-on, readily lent their support and, eager to get their pictures in the paper, they duly obeyed a directive to dress down and make the place more untidy. You want the readers to think that you're poor, starving students, don't you? On July the 24th, 1960, the Sunday People published its beatneck piece alongside a photograph that was to be the first Britain would see of John Lennon. With sideburns past his earlobes and sporting sunglasses, 
he had pride of place, lolling about on the littered floor among other self-conscious beatniks. I was looking for a name like the crickets that meant two things. And from crickets, I got the Beatles. And I changed the BEA because it didn't mean two things on its own without B E T L E S. Didn't mean two things. So I changed the A. I had the E to the A. And it meant two things then. You know, it was Beat and Beatles. And when you, when you said it, people thought of crawly things. And when you read it, it was Beat music. John, you see, was suddenly modelling himself on Van Gogh, Modigliani, and idols other than Elvis Presley, Gene Vincent, et al. Much of this was down to the influence of Stuart Sutcliffe, a gifted painter whose lecture notebooks were as conscientiously full as Lennon's were empty. When course assessment work was pending, John would cadge assistance from Stuart and Cynthia as easily as he would a cigarette. Through Stuart's influence too, Lennon shook off enough ingrained indolence to transfer from lettering to painting and actually to do some work using this media. He also became less disinterested in the theory of art to the extent that a lecture was no longer approached exclusively as an avenue for either illicit relaxation or exercising his wit at the tutor's expense. In turn, Sutcliffe's wonderment at Lennon extended to spectating whenever George Harrison and Paul McCartney, still schoolboys, absconded from lessons to rehearse with John in the College of Arts Life Room. Alternatively, John, Stuart and the schoolboys might sit and while away the hours at one of the kidney-shaped tables in the Jacaranda, a coffee bar a convenient stone's throw away. The bar was owned by Alan Williams, who began acting in a quasi-managerial capacity for John's group after Stuart was roped in to play one of those new-fangled electric bass guitars. Lennon and Sutcliffe also originated a more attention-grabbing name, the Silver Beatles, with Beatles spelt as in beat music. What they needed now more than ever was a drummer that had been lacking since the last days of the Quarrymen. Early in 1960, they found one in Tommy Moore, though it was assumed that, with his heart in jazz, 26-year-old Tommy would suffice only as a temporary arrangement. They hoped eventually to find someone who could help dispel their growing reputation as posers, as they were derided by certain members of more workmanlike Liverpool pop outfits, such as Cass and the Casanovas, Rory Storm and the Hurricanes, and Derry and the Seniors. John and Paul's pretensions as composers caused comment too, along the lines that no one, from the teenager in a dance hall to the director of the BBC Light programme, would be interested in homemade songs. Nevertheless, the Silver Beatles were developing into a credible attraction in welfare institutes, far-flung suburban palais, Lancashire village halls, working men's clubs, pub function rooms and, indeed, any venue that had embraced regular beat sessions. Much to their disappointment, however, they were not to figure among the local talent on the 3rd of May when Gene Vincent headlined a three-hour spectacular promoted by Alan Williams and the celebrated pop Svengali Larry Parnes. In the jacaranda after the show, Parnes thought aloud about a further, albeit less ambitious, joint venture with Alan Williams. He wanted, he said, an all-purpose backing outfit for use by certain of his singers. A name he kept mentioning was Billy Fury, a Liverpudlian then on the crest of his first top 10 breakthrough. Larry would bring Billy along if Alan could hurriedly assemble some groups for him to see. Though John Lennon was present in the Jacaranda too, he could not summon the courage to approach the great man at the time, although two nights later, John asked Williams if the Silver Beatles could audition for the job. Less than a fortnight after doing so, the group were off on a string of eight one-nighters in Scotland Backing not Billy Fury, but a lesser Pans luminary, Johnny Gentle. As each of the group members' small wage dwindled, the spurious thrill of going professional gave way more and more to stoic cynicism, particularly following a depressing engagement notable for Tommy Moore drumming with his head in bandages, 
the sole casualty when the van crashed into a stationary car the previous afternoon. Well before they steamed back to Liverpool after the final date, a disgusted Moore, with only two pounds left to show for his pains, had had enough of being a silver beetle. A group without a drummer was no use to anyone at that time. Into the bargain, traditional jazz bands were more numerous than ever, and so were places they could play. In the cavern, Liverpool's main jazz stronghold, manager Ray McFall would dock the fee of any band who dared to launch into a rock and roll number within its hallowed and clammy walls. It was small wonder, therefore, that the lads now trading as just plain Beatles were open to an offer of work in Germany. I haven't got a nice personality. <laughs> no, I don't think I really have good and tight humor. That's just an expression people use. Bruno Koschmida, owner of Hamburg's Kaiser Keller Club, needed a comparable draw to Tony Sheridan, a British singing guitarist of unusual flair, who was administering a powerful rock and roll elixir at a rival establishment, the Top Ten. Bruno's first contact was Alan Williams, who sent Derry and the Seniors. Within days, the Kaiser Keller was thriving, and Kosh Mida's thoughts turned to the Indra, his strip club. With few customers most evenings, it could only be more profitable to put on pop there too. When another group was requested, Bruno's man in Liverpool did not dismiss the idea of sending the Beatles, provided they could enlist a drummer. At the Casbah, a teenage haunt where they'd played as quarrymen, they discovered that proprietor Mona Bess' handsome son Pete was beating the skins with the club's resident quartet, the Blackjacks. With the information that the Blackjacks were about to disband, there was no harm in the Beatles asking if he fancied a trip to Hamburg. Pete would pack his case with Mona's full approval, but John had to jump the highest hurdle of parental opposition. Nevertheless, tight-lipped Mimi eventually let him go perhaps admitting inwardly, as he did, that his ignominious art college career was over. On the 17th of August 1960, John breathed foreign air for the first time when the night ferry docked at the Hook of Holland. Many hours later, he and the others climbed down from Alan Williams' minibus outside the Kaiser Keller, plusher than any palais they'd seen on Merseyside. It was therefore a disappointment when Herr Koshmida conducted them round the dingy Indra and then to three small and windowless rooms adjoining a toilet in a cinema over the road. This was where they'd sleep. It would have sickened pigs, but Lennon had recovered enough of his ebullience to bark, Raus, raus, schnell, schnell, when after a couple of hours of convalescent sloth, the Beatles rose to give their first ever performance outside the United Kingdom. John's runaway tongue unfurled, and the sailors, gangsters, prostitutes, tourists and teenagers who stumbled in from the street laughed with him and even took a chance on the dance floor as they got used to the newcomers' ragged yet refreshingly dissimilarity to the contrived splendour of the television pop stars. Soon, the Beatles were moved uptown to the Kaiser Keller where, over six onstage hours a night, six days a week, they were a howling success to a clientele for whom the personality of the house band had previously been secondary to boozing, brawling and the pursuit of romance. With John behaving like a composite of every rock and roller he'd ever admired, the band seized songs by the scruff of the neck and wrung the life out of them. As the season progressed, the Liverpool boys stretched out the 15 or so numbers they'd cobbled together with a newly enlisted Pete until the monotony of duplicating them over and over again caused them to insert even the most obscure material that could be dug up from their common unconsciousness. Few Lennon-McCartney items were unveiled then, but a typical bouncer's memory was of the two composing in the band room during intervals between sets, rather than joining the others at the bar. That all five Beatles were ex-grammar school and technically of Britain's academic elite may have been a subliminal lure for Hamburg's existentialist crowd, the Exis, of which Astrid Kirchherr, 
Jürgen Vollmer and Klaus Vormann were leading lights. In John, some detected a strength of personality lacking in the rest. Lennon, the obvious leader, was like a typical rocker, said Vollmer. Aggressive restraint, a Brando type. Yet he wasn't all sullen magnetism, as he had no qualms about using coarse language in heated moments on the boards, and would attack, say, Chuck Berry's roll over Beethoven with a blood curdling dementia of one in the throes of a fit. He'd also taken to breaking into mock Hitlerian speeches and jibes about the war to a mob uncomprehending, disbelieving, or scandalized into laughter. Pouring a gargantuan quantity of alcohol and amphetamines into himself, Lennon's off-duty rampaging gave foundation to many of the embellished tales that would unfold later, such as that of the golden rain that squirted from his bladder onto the wimples of three promenading nuns and the foul-mouthed sermons from the same balcony. Like many so-called extroverts, John also camouflaged an inborn sensitivity by wearing the metaphorical armour of the rough, untamed Scouser. Yet his barbed invective was often laced with brusque affection, as epitomised by a memorable first encounter in Hamburg with Frank Allen, one of Middlesex's Cliff Bennett and the Rebel Rousers. Ah yes, it's Frank, isn't it? acknowledged John after being introduced. I hear that next to Cliff, you're the most popular member in the band. I don't know why. Your harmonies are fucking ridiculous. Despite their growing popularity, it wasn't all smiles with Bruno Koschmieder, who had lately grown rather leery of the Beatles. It's good, he'd exclaim with a scowl that said it wasn't, after interrogating them over a tale he'd been told of their plan to defect the top 10 club. Acting swiftly, he gave them a month's notice and withdrew whatever immunity he'd sorted out with the police concerning the youngest Beatles' nightly violation of a curfew forbidding under-18s from frequenting nightclubs after midnight. Thus, George Harrison's deportation was arranged by late November, and within a fortnight, the Beatles were even less of a group after Best and McCartney were ordered out of the fatherland on a trumped-up charge of arson. If the Beatles made it in quotes overnight, which we didn't, the next people that make it will really make it overnight. On reuniting back in Liverpool, the Beatles delivered casually cataclysmic performances that their lengthy sojourn in Hamburg had wrought. In days when vocal balance was achieved by simply moving back and forth on the microphone, the three-part harmonies of John, Paul and George were hard won, but perfected in readiness for what lay ahead for them, if not for Pete and Stewart. Soon to die, Stuart had, for all practical purposes, left the group by then anyway. When Paul transferred to bass, lead and rhythm guitars often merged in interlocking concord with Harrison's virtuosity and Lennon's good-bad rawness, even to more proficient players who could hear what was technically askew. The Beatles now epitomised the two guitar-bass-drums archetype of what will be remembered nationally as 1963's Mersey Beat Explosion, but there was little indication of that two years earlier. Nevertheless, word of the Beatles got round, and they quickly amassed a full booking schedule with an easy reach in the insalubrious beat clubs in every vicinity of the region. They became regular fixtures at the Cavern, which had gone over to mainstream pop while they were still in Hamburg, where they also returned to work again throughout 1961's Cold Summer. This was a notable expedition for a recording session accompanying Tony Sheridan, which resulted in a German chart entry with an arrangement of the traditional My Bonnie. Lennon would assume Sheridan's lead vocal when it was incorporated into the Beatles' act during their next series of domestic one-nighters. They had taken their impact in Hamburg and on Merseyside to its limit, but no one knew how to advance to the step between consolidation of a provincial following and the threshold of the big time. Which way are we going, boys? Lennon would chant when spirits were low. To the top, Johnny, was the Pavlov's dog response. What top? To the toppermost of the poppermost. 
consolation for lack of interest in the elsewhere was the fact that the Beatles were heading the first division of Merseyside popularity, having won the first readers poll in Bill Harry's new fortnightly journal, Mersey Beat. As a testimony to the depth and cohesion of parochial pop, the first edition had sold out within a day. Such was the strength of demand for its venue information, news coverage and irregular features such as Lennon's Beat Coma column, the first published examples of his prose. The Beatles moved up another rung or two in their acquisition of a bona fide manager in Brian Epstein, sales manager of a central Liverpool department store, for reasons that included his erotic attraction to John. As Larry Parnes would have advised him, Brian's first task was to transform the four leather-clad louts, three sporting Pilton Cops haircuts, or mushroom heads to you and me, into what a respectable London agent or record mogul, in those naive times, expected a decent pop group to be. Scuttling about like a mother hen, Brian compelled his new clients to wear the stylish, but not too way out uniform suits he'd bought them. Playing to a fixed program, punctuality and back projection were all important. Stage patter must not include cursing or attempts to pull front row girls. They weren't to eat or smoke on the boards anymore. The enforcement of this transformation met with tetchy shows of resistance, especially from Lennon. But these lessened after Mr Epstein's clout as a major retailer impelled Decker to summon the Beatles to London for a recording test on New Year's Day 1962. All of our records have had some kind of harmony on them. Yeah, that's good, isn't it? Good ballads and good beats. <laughs> In the end, Decker weren't interested, but even without a record deal, the Beatles were now a cut above all other Mersey Beat outfits, having risen to the challenge of a ballroom circuit that extended as far south as Swindon. As for Hamburg, they'd be there again in April to wow them at the new Star Club, supporting and proudly socialising with Fats Domino, Gene Vincent, and other visiting heroes of their school days. Several weeks earlier, the Beatles had finished their first BBC radio broadcast, Teenager's Turn, from Manchester's Playhouse, where the studio audience mobbed them outside the theatre. Elsewhere, it was standing room only most nights, and John, Paul, George and Pete had ascertained from a buzz in the air that they were almost there. Everybody knows what happened next. An EMI subsidiary, Parlophone, signed the Beatles in June 1962, just before the replacement of Pete Best with Ringo Starr, one of Rory Storm's Hurricanes. The new recruit wasn't the most versatile drummer in Liverpool, but he posed no limelight threatening challenge to the front line, being a member for girls to adore as a brother, rather than as demon lover. Love Me Do, the first single under the Beatles' new lineup, was released in October 1962, and the rest, as they often say, is history. Next up was the conquest of Britain via hit parade Merseybeat, Beatlemania and a royal variety show remembered for John's saucy Rattle Your Jewelry ad lib. A prosy Sunday Times article lauded Lennon and McCartney as the outstanding composers of 1963. Two years later, all four Beatles would be driven through cheering masses to Buckingham Palace for investiture by the Queen as members of the British Empire. No honours list before or since was ever as controversial, and one wonders how many of the disgusted senior civil servants and retired admirals would not have returned their medals to Her Majesty had they known how unwillingly the chief beetle had been to accept his. Kids everywhere go for the same stuff had been John's forthright theory in 1964 when they subjugated North America too. Launched with an unprecedented publicity blitz, the group were embraced there with a passion that left Beatle maniacs back home at the starting line. Their singles, even a reissue of the one with Sheridan, swamped North America's top ten five or six at a time, and their sack drummer milked his affinity to the group via a six-month run of sellout dates 
with his Pete Best combo. The rest of the world was a pushover, but for its conquistadors, it was an intrusive and frequently dangerous place, its immensity and richness lying beyond a barrier of screeching hysteria and the pitiless woomph of flashbulbs. After the media had sensationalised the story of Lennon boasting that his Beatles were more popular than Christ, the possible in-concert slaughter of the artists by divine wrath or someone acting on the Almighty's behalf heightened. In fact, it led to improved attendances during an exceptionally stressful world tour in 1966. If anything, John, in the original Evening Standard interview, appeared to be bemoaning the increasing godlessness of the times. But still, he was trotted out to make a statement that most took as an apology, hours before opening night in Chicago. In the Deep South, the heart of the Bible Belt, the previous week, Thousands of Beatle discs were ceremoniously pulverised in a tree-grinding machine, box offices were picketed by Ku Klux Klansmen, and anti beetle hellfire sermons preached. While this was counterbalanced by I Love John lapel badges outselling all associated merchandise when the tour got underway, the entire episode fueled the Beatles' much-mooted decision to down tools as a working band. No longer within earshot of each other, as they'd been on every working day since God knows when, artistic and emotional ties slackened. Yet John had been entering a separate orbit, long before. As token Beatle, it had been he who'd been invited to take part in BBC Television's Jukebox Jury, weeks prior to the whole quartet comprising the panel in a special edition at the Liverpool Empire. While mere sideshows to his pivotal role in the Beatles, among solo projects that followed were two slim but best-selling volumes of verse, stories and cartoons, and a bit part in How I Won the War, a movie on general release in the period between Brian Epstein's untimely death in August 1967 and December's interesting but boring TV spectacular, the self-produced Magical Mystery Tour. After that, the only direction should have been down, but Beatle discs continue to sell by the megaton. I put it down to Yoko, you know. She's brought out the real me, you know. She's me in drag. <laughs> Yet as autumn leaves fell on the group, the man in the street raised quizzical eyebrows when, after dabbling with the mental distortions of LSD, of which Lennon was the most avid consumer, they plunged into transcendental meditation under the Maharishi and the controlled weirdness of Apple Core, an enterprise intended to cater for maverick, artistic and scientific ventures. John, for example, put a certain Alex Mardis in charge of Apple Electronics, a post that rapidly became a sinecure, as one after another, Alex's wondrous patents progressed no further than him talking about them. Another plan, formulated by Lennon, was for ex-quarryman Ivan Vaughan, now a Cambridge graduate, to set up a school for the Beatles' children and those of their friends. Various properties were inspected, and the skeleton of a steering committee established before Apple's accounting division argued that it just wasn't viable. Lennon's more public behaviour was to puzzle Joe Average even more after he left Cynthia and their infant son Julian to move in with Yoko Ono, a Japanese-American who was to art what the sadly missed screaming Lord Such was to British politics. And it is at this point that the story becomes as much Yoko's as John's. The latest journey of John Lennon barely recognisable as the chirpy, yeah, 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 mop top on the Raw Variety Show, had started when he'd been introduced to Yoko in 1966, during the London preview of her Unfinished Paintings and Objects exhibition. Charmed by the all-white chess set, the apple with a £200 price tag, and other puzzling displays, he funded Yoko's next event, taking a benevolent interest in her activities, past and present. Yoko had also tried to make it as a pop singer, but had found a niche only in the distant reaches of avant-garde jazz. 
In the company of respected figures like Onet Coleman, she used her voice like a frontline horn, interjecting screeches, wails and nanny goat jabber into the proceedings. As she did at a performance at the University of Cambridge, with Lennon squatting at her feet, his back to the audience, holding an electric guitar against a speaker to create ear-splitting feedback. After nature had taken its course one 1968 night, when Cynthia was away from the family home on a Weybridge stockbroker estate, a writer to Beatles Monthly expressed the widespread view that Cynthia and John's subsequent divorce eroded the Beatles' magic even more than the absence of the anticipated Yuletide single had in 1966. Annihilating completely any cosy illusion such fans had left was John's first non-Beatle long player. The unmelodious avant gardenings of his and Yoko's unfinished music number one. Two virgins might have been anticipated, even tolerated, but not its cover photograph of the pair doe-eyed and naked front and back. It was, they explained, an art statement. Joe Average was, however, in too much of a non-plus to give an art reply to this and two more funny, peculiar albums. Issued on Zapple, Apple's short-lived subsidiary record label, Life with the Lions was concerned principally with Ono's miscarriage. Most self-centred of all was 1969's wedding album, one side of which was the two's repeated utterances of each other's name, suspended over pounding heartbeats. Now with hair down to his back, bearded to the cheekbones and defiantly round-spectacled, John had smoked a cigarette during the quiet, white costumed wedding in Gibraltar on March the 20th. The ceremony was mentioned in the Ballad of John and Yoko, the Beatles' final British number one. That each chorus began with the exclamation Christ restricted the airplay, and the entire narrative confirmed the Lennon status as a scandalous couple on a par with Serge Gainsbourg and Jane Birkin after they'd simulated sexual congress on that summer's million-selling Je t'aime. Moi non plus. At times, Ono and Lennon's unconventional behaviour embraced issues many people didn't want to confront. John and the Wallace Simpson of pop had made their headline-hogging lives an open and highly controversial book, with such outrageous pranks as press conferences from inside king-size white sacks, a slapdash letter that would accompany John's renouncement of his MBE, sending acorns to world leaders, the self-portrait film short starring John's Willy and his scrawly lithographs of themselves having sex. Taped at one of their bed-ins for world peace was Lennon's Give Peace a Chance anthem, which attributed to the ad hoc Plastic Ono Band was his first smash without Paul, George and Ringo. With hastily rehearsed accompanists that included guitarist Eric Clapton, the Lennons next performed at a Canadian pop festival Recorded and released as live piece in Toronto 1969, their set consisted mainly of 50s classic rock. Yoko's screech singing and a nascent arrangement of Cold Turkey, a forthcoming new single. Its B-side was Yoko's Don't Worry Kyoko, Mummy's Only Looking for a Hand in the Snow, which could have been about anything or nothing. However, a Beatleologist might conjecture that it was an exaggerated commemoration of John missing a bend and rolling over a hired Austin Maxi somewhere in the Scottish Highlands. Only one passenger, Julian, escaped uninjured. Yoko John and Yoko's daughter, Kyoko, needed stitches. Lennon found Don't Worry Kyoko as potent as his adolescent self had Little Richard's Tutti Frutti. Workouts of Don't Worry Kyoko and Cold Turkey filled his last stage appearance in Britain with a Plastic Ono supergroup at a charity Knees Up at London's Lyceum Ballroom in December 1969. However, when Don't Worry Kyoko plunged into its 20th cacophonous, headache-inducing minute, he and the other musicians, including George Harrison and The Who's Keith Moon, exchanged nervous glances. A 
seen Paul and Ringo a lot this year uh, because they've been over here. Paul was here about a month ago and I spent a couple of Beaujolais evenings with him reminiscing about when we were only 38. And Ringo I've seen a lot of because he's been over here recording. I was just down in the middle of my album. I just took a break and went down and did a track I'd written for Ringo on his new album. So, and uh, Paul and Ringo, yeah, George I haven't seen, but he's coming over in October to rehearse. So I'll go and see him then. Cold Turkey, like 1970s echo-laden instant karma, was issued, so Lennon put it, as an escape valve from the Beatles, from which he'd cast his net furthest. In its death throes, the group was shilly-shallying between ineffectual endeavours to get back to its Hamburg-forged genesis and the colour supplement art of Abbey Road. Having soundtracked the 1960s, they wouldn't be able, as solo stars and ex-Beatles, to so minister to the next decade when all but the most snow-blinded would understand how ordinary, even dull, the mere mortals behind the myth could be. All four were above the tour-album-tour sandwiches, incumbent upon poorer stars, and each could wait until he felt like going on the road again or making a new record. Yet after picking and choosing from both famous friends and the most fashionable and highly waged studio musicians, none of them would ever accomplish what the Beatles, for all their casually strewn errors, had committed to tape instinctively and without complacency. Until well into the 1970s, John, George, Paul and Ringo's regrouping was seen as inevitable by even the most marginally hopeful outsider, for whom the concept of collecting every record the Beatles ever made was not yet economically unsound. Thus any ex-Beatle was assured of at least a minor hit, even with a substandard product. Lennon's solo debut after the group's final recording date, at which he was not present, in January 1970, was an eponymous album. Like its vinyl companion, Yoko Ono, Plastic Ono Band, it was the cathartic result of a primal scream therapy course under American psychologist Dr. Arthur Janov. With the exhilaration of the impromptu prized more than technical accuracy, this experience was evidenced in personal exorcisms like Mother and Isolation, as well as stark rejections of former heroes and ideals, notably in God, and a projection of himself as working-class hero, an acoustic ballad banned by most daytime radio stations for its use of the F-word. Ripe language and soul-bearing were apparent in contemporary newspaper interviews too, as was the almost audible snigger whenever Lennon sniped at McCartney. His old colleague was pilloried further in How Do You Sleep from 1971's Imagine, with George Harrison in support on lead guitar. By contrast, Imagine also contained peons of Axorius Bent, such as O oh Yoko, O oh My Love, and the apologetic Jealous Guy, as well as a utopian title track, Fairy Dusted with Strings, that would endure as Lennon's most memorable post Beatles opus. That August, George was to invite John to participate in his concerts for Bangladesh in New York but only on the understanding there'd be no place on stage for Yoko too. Don't worry Kyoko at the Lyceum was too vivid a memory. However, as the evil hour when her husband was actually going to perform without her crept closer, Ono's rage exploded in a tantrum of such violence that crushing his spectacles in his fist, John had slammed out of their hotel for the next flight back to England. Harrison's event took place regardless and in one throw, he outshone all of John and Yoko's more mystifying tactics to right the wrongs of mankind. Perhaps in a spirit of one-upmanship, John spoke briefly of a Wembley show for a worthy cause with him, Yoko and their sort of people, instead of George and his Bangladesh crowd. This was jettisoned when Lennon left his country of birth forever on the 13th of August 1971. His attempts to settle on US soil were hindered by an earlier conviction in Britain for possession of marijuana. This meant that he had to keep reapplying for an extension of his visa to stay there. Purportedly, ceaseless official harassment may have been provoked too by anti-government sentiments expressed on various tracks, including the 1971 single Power to the People, 
and his and Ono's slogan-ridden Sometime in New York double album on which they were backed by Elephant's Memory, a local band fresh from a maiden Hot 100 strike. This joint venture also embraced excerpts from both a Lyceum extravaganza and a jam session with Frank Zappa's Mothers of Invention. Nevertheless, apart from the odd inspired moment, such as the driving revival of the Olympics' Well Baby, Please Don't Go, with Zappa, the kindest critics agreed that Sometime in New York was documentary rather than recreational. Yet for all this latest display of artistic and romantic unity, there was trouble in paradise, and Lennon left Ono in 1973 for a 15-month lost weekend in California, where he lived with Mei Pang, her Chinese secretary. He also fell in with Harry Nilsson, Keith Moon, and other hard drinkers. With his own marriage floating into a choppy sea too, Ringo Starr also flopped onto the adjacent stool for three in the morning bar hopping and late afternoon mutual grogginess by the swimming pool of a rented Oceanside chalet in Santa Monica, beneath the woodland sweep of the Hollywood Hills. Although futile, the gang's attempts at staying the phantoms of middle age were mostly harmless, and stories of their escapades improved with age. Among these was John's excessively worshipful and inebriated audience with Jerry Lee Lewis, and Ringo securing Cherry Vanilla, a singing thespian much given to exposing her bust, to recite Shakespeare during John's birthday celebrations. More widely reported was the incident when Lennon, with a sanitary towel fixed to his forehead, was ejected from a nightclub where he and Nilsson had been heckling the Smothers Brothers comedy duo. John managed to keep a civil tongue in his head. When he and Paul got together for a chat in Los Angeles, in the light of appeals from the United Nations on behalf of the Vietnamese boat people, and from someone with more money than sense, who offered $50 million for just one more Beatles performance, even if there was a danger that what he'd hear might not be magic, just music. Time hadn't healed but their lingered memories of the struggle back in Liverpool and its unbelievable outcome. In a dark hour professionally, McCartney let slip that he wouldn't mind working with Lennon again on a casual basis, while John was now saying how wrong it was for the group to have split up so decisively. For all the hail fellow well-met camaraderie, the fact that all four were losing their grip one way or another meant it wasn't the firmest foundation for a second coming of the Beatles. Pressed on the subject, Gary Glitter hit the nail on the head. They'll have to come back as a bigger creative force than before, which will be very difficult indeed. As difficult too had been Muhammad Ali regaining his world heavyweight title in 1975. Possibly, the Beatles might have regained theirs, even though the world had become wiser to their individual weaknesses. Their very vacillation over the matter indicated neither destitution nor any real enthusiasm. Paul went back to the simple life on his Sussex farm, George to an ill-judged US tour, and John and Ringo were sucked back into the woozy vortex of Santa Monica. I'd like to live to ripe old age with Yoko only, you know. And I'm not afraid of dying. I don't know how I'd feel at the moment, but I'm prepared for death because I don't believe in it. I think it's just getting out of one car and getting into another. Glassy-eyed musings and vocational turbulence slopped over onto albums like Nilsson's Pussycats, produced by Lennon, who also wrote the title song to Ringo's Goodnight Vienna. John's own mind games were so-so. But Walls and Bridges, if rehashing some old ideas, still spawn strong spin-off singles and US chart topper Whatever Gets You Through the Night with Elton John, and ethereal Number 9 Dream, which likewise climbed far higher in the Hot 100 than anywhere else. In publicity photographs taken at the time, John didn't look much different from the way he did in the beatnik horror. 
As regressive in its way was 1975's rock and roll, its content telegraphed on the sleeve by a photograph of 1961 vintage and the artist's own sentiment, you should have been there. Having come full circle with this retrospective of favourites from the Hamburg era, a greatest hits collection entitled Shaved Fish, and EMI's impending reissue of all 20 Beatles singles on the same day, Lennon chose to take a year off to master his inner chaos and take professional and personal stock. While growing to manhood in the hothouse of the beat boom and its endless aftermath, he'd been treated like a food pigeonhole in a self-service cafeteria. No more could it be taken for granted that John Lennon existed only to vend entertainment, with a side serving of cheap insight. He'd let go, stopped trying to prove himself. All the intolerable adulation his life contained, the hit records, the money down the drain, could be transformed to matters of minor importance. Reunited with Yoko, he was finally granted US residential status. He and his wife's happiness was completed by the arrival of their only surviving baby, Sean. On John's 35th birthday, judged an appropriate moment to enter a period of artistic lassitude in New York's exclusive Dakota block. He wasn't unduly worried. What was the use in any case of continuing to mine the same worn out creative seams over and over again from new angles in wrong-headed expectation of finding gold? Not a melody or lyric would be heard commercially from Lennon for not one, but four years after Cooking in the Kitchen of Love, an apt donation to a Ringo Starr album in 1976. What right had anyone to expect more? He said as much in a reluctantly granted press conference in Japan a year later. Once you'd seen too much of him, but now John Lennon was cited less frequently than the Loch Ness Monster. Mention of him during his house husband years still brings out strange stories of what alleged insiders claim they heard and saw. Yet belying a growing legend of John as the Howard Hughes of pop, a chance encounter with him on holiday in Bermuda caused one journalist to report that John's songwriting well was not as arid as many imagined. This was confirmed in August 1980 when he and Ono recorded material sufficient to fill two albums. The first of these, Double Fantasy, which could almost be filed under easy listening, was issued that autumn. There were even enough numbers left for Lennon to give Life Begins at 40 and three others to Ringo when that November the two ex-Beatles spoke for the last time. To promote Double Fantasy, John was suddenly available for interviews again with the unblinking self-assurance of old. At a press conference back in 1964, he'd answered a question about retirement with a rhetorical, who'd want to be an 80-year-old Beatle? On the 8th of December 1980, he was gunned down on a New York sidewalk by a so-called fan, who was Beatle crazy in the most clinical sense. Are you John Lennon? asked one of the cops in whose squad car the victim was hastened to hospital. Yeah, gasped John. Then he died. Dressed in my teen old brown sweater, I easily mixed with the crowd at Neville Club. I see me whole. Soon, all oh but soon, people acoustic me saying such thing as, we're the charge, man. I'm turning over. All too soon, I notice boys and girls sitting in a hu hobbled lump, smoking hernia and taking odium and getting very high. Double Fantasy and its follow-up, Milk and Honey, reflect an appropriate, beautiful sadness in places, befitting the tragedy bequeathed them. Beautiful Boy, for example, advised five-year-old Sean Lennon of what happens to you when you're busy making other plans. And Hard Times Are Over hauntingly contains a line, you and I walking together around a street corner. In contrast, the tracks watching the wheels Nobody Told Me, which borrowed the tune of Mama Said, a Shirelle's B-side, 
and Help Me to Help Myself were riven with an amused, grace-saving cynicism, while the single Just Like Starting Over hinted musically at his Mersey Beat genesis. Overall, however, both Double Fantasy and Milk and Honey were smug, slight statements from a rich, refined couple, long and perhaps guiltily detached from the everyday. Long ago, their antics had been wilder than those of any punk rocker, but with 1981 approaching, John and Yoko had been derided by punks and hippies alike as indolent breadheads and wholesomely Americanized mainstays of contemporary rock's ruling class. Be that as it may, universal grief and an element of ghoulish Beatlemania was to reverse the fall of double fantasy and just like starting over from their respective listings, and John would score a hat-trick of posthumous British number ones before February, an achievement matching only that of his Beatles in the dear, dead, swinging 60s. Out of sympathy too, Yoko engineered her only top 40 entry without him, and for the first time since the two virgins, John's bum made the cover of Rolling Stone. The leader of the bands arrived, bawled a new Musical Express reader's letter, presuming that John was being conducted to the table head in some pop Valhalla. A spiritualist au fait with Lennon's afterlife adventures knew of his affair with a long-departed Hollywood actress, a claim that may well have inflamed his volcanic widow, whose season of glass album sleeve depicted a pair of bloodstained spectacles, while the follow-up, It's All Right, employed trick photography whereby spectral John stood next to her and Sean in what looks like a recreation ground. The best known of tribute discs to Lennon was George Harrison's All Those Years Ago. By association, George was to end 1981, seven places behind John as 10th top male vocalist in Billboard's awards. Regardless of its sing-along mediocrity, another incentive for buyers was the superimposed presence of Paul and Ringo on the track. During John's Lost Weekend, Harrison had suggested the two of them ratify an old rumour by forming a group with Starr and Klaus Vormann, now an accomplished bass player, but John, still peeved by perhaps the Bangladesh business, had floored George with a slight of verbal judo, and Julie shrugged off this idea. Lennon was an artist with whom Brian Ferry, via Melody Maker article, expressed a wish to collaborate. Brian may have told the man himself when, in 1974, he dined with John, George and Ringo in New York. Touring Germany with Roxy Music the week after Lennon's passing, Ferry closed the show with Jealous Guy. The studio recording was to top the UK hit parade, the only Roxy Music release to do so. Sean Lennon's godfather, Elton John, got no further than the edge of the top 50 with his empty garden in 1982, but Mike Oldfield appeared on Top of the Pops months later to plug his Moonlight Shadow, which addressed itself to the horror outside the Dakota on the evening it happened. The central figure of Oldfield's ditty was not John, but Yoko, who'd not retreated from the limelight. She'd sanction and partly compare 1990s televised and international tribute to her late spouse at Liverpool's Pierhead. While they declined to show up in person, Ringo and Paul each sent a filmed sequence. Conspicuously uninvited to participate were any Mersey Beat groups from the early days. That's why I mean I don't regret anything. Meditation, I still believe in, and occasionally I use it. And I don't regret any of that. I don't regret taking drugs because they help me. I don't advocate them for everybody because I don't think I should, you know. But for me, it was good, and India was good for me. And I met Yoko just before I went to India, and it's beautiful. How different could John Lennon's life have been? This is probably a silly hypothetical exercise, but let's transfer to a parallel dimension for a few minutes. In it, John quits the Beatles, an obscure 1960s beat group, 
for a hand-to-mouth existence as a jobbing commercial artist in Liverpool. For a while, he's on the periphery of the Liverpool scene, before a supplicatory chat with his old tutor, Arthur Ballard, who offers him a post as technician in Ballard's department at the college. As his marriage to Cynthia deteriorates, John becomes a fixture in Ye Crack, the student pub where he often rambles on with rueful and misplaced pride about the Beatles' meagre achievements. On one maudlin evening, he brings in his photo album, Us with Tony Sheridan, Me, Paul and George with Ringo Starr in the top 10. Ringo was in Georgie Fame's Blue Flames later on, you know. Most regulars find both John's reminiscences and the pictures mind stultifyingly boring. For beer money and a laugh, Lennon reforms the group for bookings in local watering holes. They become as peculiar to Liverpool alone as Mickey Finn, a comedian unknown nationally but guaranteed work for as long as he can stand on Merseyside. A typical engagement is providing music after Finn's entertainment at a dinner and dance at Latham Hall on the 9th of December 1980, when the Beatles leave a dancing audience wanting more. The group's personnel on the Night of Nights consists of Pete Best, Deputy Manager at Garston Job Centre on drums, George Harrison, a Southport curate, on guitar, Paul McCartney, a radio Merseyside presenter and amateur songwriter, on bass, and Lennon, his singing voice darker and attractively shorn of 1960s ingenuity, now a slightly batty art lecturer who'd wed a Japanese performance artist he'd seen at a 1967 happening at the college. Unreal life isn't like that, at least it wasn't for John. As with John F. Kennedy and Elvis Presley, everyone remembers the moment they heard of his passing. John who? Pete Best spluttered from his shaving mirror when Mrs. Best shouted the news upstairs that eerie morning on Merseyside. Before the day was out, it became clear that John Lennon wasn't going to recover from the dead, and so quills were sharpened for numerous and notorious Lennon biographies. Before they'd even wiped away the tears too, record moguls pondered what tracks by Lennon or associated with him they were entitled to rush release or re-promote. Under the editorial lash, pressured denizens of the media cobbled together hasty obituaries. One of the more memorable comments any of them reported was by the recently retired Arthur Ballard. I think his death is more significant than that of a leading politician. Like Michelangelo has never been forgotten, neither will John Lennon be. Thank you for buying Maximum Lennon. We hope you enjoyed it. Watch out for further titles on Chrome Dreams coming up soon. If you did enjoy it or have any comments or suggestions, write to us at Chrome Dreams, PO Box 230, New Malden, Surrey, UK, KT36YY, or email on mail at chromedreams.co.uk. For more details on joining the Maximum Collectors Club and claiming your free CDs, check out our website at www.chromedreams.co.uk or look at the booklet inside this CD. Thanks again for listening and goodbye for now.